Hello. <laughs> and hello to you. Yes. Well, how would you like to get the victory over situations or circumstances that have been in your life for years, maybe decades? Well, stay tuned. This is going to be a great program. Amen. And the name of the book we're going to talk about is 25 Powerful Promises from God. And you say, is that all he has, 25? No, he's got a lot more promises than that. He's got a promise for everything that you have a need of. And that's the truth. Yes, it is. And uh, we're going to be talking to Mike Shreve, one of my favorite longtime buddies. He's been coming here for many, many years. But today, as every time he comes, we learn something new. And the Groover family is with us, and yes. they're going to be singing a great song called Zeal. I love Psalm 9, verse 1 and 2. It says, I will give thanks to you, Lord. With all my heart, I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you, and I will sing praises to your name. So right there where you're at, we want you to join in with us. We want you to lift your voice, put those hands together. We're just hungry for him, and we want more of his presence. So come on, let's bless his name.
Thank you so much. We appreciate the rumors. And we appreciate this next guest. You are going to appreciate him if you've never seen him before. And if you have seen him before, you're going to appreciate him more because God is doing some great things in and through his life. And I've known him for 35 years. At least. At least, maybe longer. Uh, and is such a remarkable life that he's led. And uh, God is doing great things in and through him and continues to do that. Mike, Mike Shreve, Shreve, we are so very, glad very to have you. Very, good to be you. here, Bob. <laughs> good to Jane, have God you. God bless you all. Love you. Love I appreciate you. this opportunity. <laughs> well, 25 powerful promises. Now, certainly, as I said before, there's more than that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Bob, there are exactly, according to one resource, 7,487 promises in God's Word, wow. which is powerful. As you mentioned yes. in the beginning, no one will ever face a problem in life where there isn't a promise sufficient enough, powerful enough, authoritative enough to push them through the opposition and the turmoil and the tribulation to sure victory on the other side one way or the other. So uh, no wonder Sid Roth said this book will make you invincible. Uh -huh. When you realize the resource you have, 7,487 promises that far too often are unclaimed. And if they're unclaimed too often, they'll be unmanifested in our lives. Mm. So we wow. need to know them. My people perish for lack of knowledge. We need to know them. But better than that, we need to vocally claim them, confess Amen. them, seize them by faith, and praise them into manifestation. Amen. And so that's all you got to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all you well, got to do. Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's more to it because ironically, not ironically, but strangely, God gives all these promises, but he attaches them all to conditions. Yes. Uh, normally the condition is in the same verse. Right. Like the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Condition, promise. Okay, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Yes. So the condition is you've got to hunger and thirst, and God says, okay, I'll fill you. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Tough condition. <laughs> you've got to be merciful to people that have harmed you, hurt you, damaged you, and to those that are hurting all around you. Yeah. And then God said, you show them mercy, I'll show you mercy. And so promises are always, and, and probably the best beatitude, the one dearest to my heart, is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wow. And I believe that's more than just seeing God at the end of the journey. I believe it's seeing God move in your life supernaturally, mightily, right here, right now. God said, you keep a pure heart, you're going to see God move in your life. Amen. Well, I tell you what, you certainly must have because you have got more supernatural stories in this. Y'all, this book, I tell you, the stories alone will build your faith up. It, this is really incredible. All these I incredible, and uh, when I say supernatural, I mean supernatural. But, you know, can we, you talk about this in the beginning of the book. Can we claim the promises that Abraham got from the Father? Well, definitely because the Bible said that we are children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. And so we've come under the fountainhead of those blessings that were promised to him. We've been grafted into Israel. If we are Gentile believers, I am, uh, and I assume yes. <laughs> you two are, then we have been grafted into Israel and receive the benefit of the promises that were made to them in the old covenant era. In yeah. fact, I claim Old Testament promises all the time. Uh, the Old Testament is full of promises concerning uh, the blessings that God will bless our children with if we walk in covenant with God. Now, like Deuteronomy 7, 9, that says, He is the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love Him to a thousand generations. So that's a promise. 
And, uh, and the condition it seems to is loving God. God said, if you love me, I'm going to make covenant and mercy hover not only over you, but over your sons and daughters, over your grandchildren, over your great grandchildren. So your offspring definitely have a significant advantage when it comes to access into spiritual things. If the blessing of God is on your life, then it will pass right down. And there are 16 different facets to the blessing of Abraham. God told Abraham in the very beginning, the first visitation, he said, I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. And when you search it out in detail, you'll find there's 16 different parts to the blessing of Abraham that all belong to me because I'm a child of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. And that blessing passes down generationally. You know, there's a lot of people that look at Israel and they don't realize the incredible promises that are in that land. Absolutely. In fact, Paul was talking about the advantage of being a Jew. And he said to them were committed the covenants, the glory, uh, the ministry to God, the priesthood. And the last thing in the list of six things is the promises. Israel inherited promises yes. that God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He gave them the promise of a promised land and a promised provision, a promised destiny. He promised uh, that there would be opposition, but that he would bring them out of that opposition. He told Abraham his seed would be strangers in the land that was not theirs, but after 400 years, he would bring them out. And when it came time for that to happen, the Bible says the time of the promise drew near. And so it was like that promise hovered over the nation of Israel for four centuries. Yeah. And then when it became time for that promise to come to pass, it was impossible to stop it. I tell people, if it's not God's time, nothing's going to make it happen. <laughs> and if it is God's time, nothing's going to stop, stop it, it from happening. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and so that's another factor we need to work into the equation is sometimes with regard to the promises, there's divine timing, divine timing. Uh, like I claim the promise for years, thou shalt be saved and thy house. And I would claim my mother and claim my father and my brother, my two sisters and all my cousins and aunts and uncles. And my mother was one of my first converts uh, and she was easy to win. She, she loved God anyway. She just didn't know how to get to him. My father though, it took 12 years, wow. but when it happened, the promise like exploded into uh, manifestation because, uh, and, and usually God sets the stage for the manifestation of promises with tragedy or with difficulty or with some kind of problem that becomes the, the uh, fertile ground for a miraculous promise to grow. And the, the problem was my father developed a neck condition where for seven days his head was locked in a bowed position. Hmm. And he was a good man, a man of integrity, a man of honor, military man. Uh, but he just didn't want to hear what I had to share when it came to my view on the Bible after I got saved. And we had a loving relationship, but he just didn't want to listen yeah. to that. Well, anyway, he called me after God manifested himself to him. He went to the hospital. He was laying there in the bed with his head bowed. And he said, later on that night, he told me, Mike, I was laying there with my head in the right position. I figured I might as well pray. <laughs> I said, subtle hint from heaven, Dad. <laughs> he said, I decided I was going to thank God for every good thing he'd ever done in my life. And it took him two hours, two hours. Wow. He went all the way back into his earliest memories. Then he said, I ran out of things to thank God for. So I decided to just praise God because he's God. I said, Dad, that's a biblical principle. You enter God's gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. He said, I don't know about it being a principle in the Bible. All I know is that while I was praising God and, and my father would never fabricate a story like this. I mean, he, he's a military man down to the detail. It has to be exactly factual. So I knew God had done this. He said, while I was praising God, he said, all of a sudden a golden light came in the hospital room 
The face of Jesus appeared in the light, battered and beaten and crowned with thorns. And he said, all of a sudden, the golden light turned to a crimson red and waves of red light started pouring over him. And he said, I knew I was being bathed in the blood of Jesus and I knew I was being born again. Praise Praise God. God. Now, what did you do at the other end of the phone? I about dropped the phone. (laughs) I thought this is not, this can't be happening right now. When God comes through, he defies logic and he defies limitations and he defies hindrances and shows up and manifests himself as God. And my father ended up becoming a Sunday school teacher and we even taught the word from the same platform. Uh, And it was wonderful. But God gave that promise. You shall be saved and your house. And I just claimed it. I fasted. Sometimes you have to fight to get the manifestation of promises. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. So it's not always an easy journey. Um, Gordon Lindsay, who started Christ for the Nations, taught that when you pray, there's a certain point every day where you need to get mad. (laughs) <laughs> when you pray, there's a certain point where you need to get mad at the opposition, mad at the hindrances and say, it is written. It is written. I yes. give you power over all the power of the enemy. It's a promise. It is written. Uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And just come against it yes. with the force and the authority that is promised, promised to you in scripture. All we have to do is turn on the TV and you will get mad about what you <laughs> yeah, hear. Absolutely. You will know that you need to bombard heaven when you I hear do. the things that come across that TV. And uh, <laughs> it's just your way of saying, God, bring it to pass. Bring it to pass. You yeah. can do it. Amen. Well, there was uh, a group of people in Swain Quarter, North Carolina. Swan that felt Quarter. Swan Quarter, okay. Yeah. And they felt like they had a promise from God about a church, that it was supposed to be on a certain piece of property, prime property downtown, and, but it was owned by a man, a man named Sam Sand- Sadler. Yeah, that's right. And he did not want to sell that land. They couldn't get him to sell it, so they built it on another piece of property. And I want you to share the rest of that story. Well, I came uh, into the knowledge of that story because a man traveled with me in the ministry whose uncle pastored that church at one point. And all of this happened in the latter 1800s. And uh, this church, this bunch of saints that loved the Lord, wanted and felt led that they were supposed to put their church on this prime property downtown. Well, the guy refused over and over again. He refused to sell them that property, Uh, but they didn't give up hope. And God sent a a flood into that area. Now, I don't think God is necessarily behind every natural disaster. It's always amused me that uh, insurance companies label acts of God, (laughs) earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, cyclones, et cetera. Uh, what about healings and miracles <laughs> and salvation? And what the but, enemy meant for bad, he could turn <laughs> right. around for his glory. But uh, in this particular case, I think God was very much behind. <clears throat> A hurricane came up the coast of North Carolina and uh, about, I don't know, four foot of water went through the community and no other building in town floated except that church <laughs> that was blocks away. And it carried, the floodwaters carried the church right down the main street of town, took a turn, went over a canal, and the floodwaters even swirled a little bit to turn the church around and set it down where the front was facing the street. Absolutely uh, amazing. That was in the paper, wasn't it? I mean, that's a fact. Yes, it's documentable. You can look it up on the internet. But where did it land? uh, uh, Right on the property that they'd (laughs) wanted all along. Sam Sadler's property. And so (laughs) Sam decided, well, I guess I better sell it to you. (laughs) So, uh, praise God, they got what they wanted. They got what God wanted yes. because yes. they held on to the mm-hmm. promise. Now, if God can move a church <laughs> hundreds, uh, probably hundreds of yards, I don't know the exact distance, but if God can move a church from one side of town to another with floodwaters, then God can move. In fact, let me point to the camera. God can move you from defeat to victory and from sickness to health and from poverty to prosperity and whatever the need may be. 
if he can move a whole church and even position it exactly where it needs to be, then God can get me where I need to be. In fact, that's a promise. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And I love Proverbs chapter three that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And here's the promise. And he shall direct your path. Three conditions hinged to a promise. And God says, I'll direct your path. If you don't try and figure it out in your own head, which I'm guilty of doing all the time, <laughs> and just trust me, just trust me. I, I, I go to prepare a place for you. And I know we always quote uh, John 14 as if it's a heavenly place. But uh, I believe you can also claim that promise within the span of this life. He said, Absolutely. let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, not only in heaven, but my next week, my next month, my next year, God's already preparing a place of fruitfulness and purpose and destiny. And I've just got to be sensitive enough to God to feel the blowing of the wind. He said, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. So God promises those who are born, B-O-R-N of the Spirit, will also be born, B-O-R-N-E of the Spirit. But you have to be yielded and sensitive. And when God says, do this or go there, then do it. Yeah. Even if it doesn't make sense. Thank God for the man who won me to the Lord. Yeah, he, and he, we're going to talk about that when we come back from a break, yeah. that new identity that he promises you. So the groupers, we're going to take a break, and the groupers will come back with Grateful. I'm sure, like me, you have a red letter edition of the Bible. We have something that is the most unique I have ever seen. My good friend for over 20 years, Jack Countryman, has compiled the most unique Bible passages from the New Testament. 100 selected words of Jesus. That's why they call it red letter words. The first red letter words of Jesus appear in print, believe it or not, back in the 1800s. Why is this exclusive edition so special? They are Jesus' words spoken while he walked the earth. 100 of them selected and explained in clear terms why Jesus said the words that you will be reading, particular words and why they have such a powerful message for a gift of $15 or more, you can receive your copy.
Thank you, Groover. Thank you awesome so song. much. Appreciate oh, wonderful it. music. Well, we've been talking with 25 major promises from God. And that's the name of the book. But there are so many more. And our dear friend, Mike Shreve, is with us today. And Mike, what about identity? What is your identity or what was your identity? Well, the three big questions that everybody asks or roll in their minds is who am I, why am I here, and where am I going? And if you answer the first one correctly, the other two take care of themselves. <laughs> and of course, you can't really find out who you are until the missing part is found. Right. And the missing link in every one of us, the missing part, is the infilling of the presence of God. And then when you find Him, you find yourself. And that's why the Bible says, if, and this is a promise, Second. Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You become a new person. And uh, in fact, when I got saved, I won't go into the whole testimony. I've shared it on uh, The Good Life often. But 48 years ago, I was a teacher of yoga and meditation at four universities in the Tampa area, as you know. I taught at USF, University of Tampa, uh, Florida Presbyterian, and New College in Sarasota. I had about 300 students who thought I was their guru. So that was my quote unquote identity. Uh, that's who I thought I was. That's who other people thought I was. That role was the role I filled. And then someone acted on the promise of God. God said, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And the man who won me to the Lord acted on that promise. And he led me to a new identity. And, and very concisely, uh, let me mention, he was walking in the laundromat and he happened to be part of a prayer group in town that had been praying for me for about a month. They read about me in the newspaper. I thought the newspaper article would increase my class attendance. I didn't know it would alert a prayer group to start <laughs> interceding for me on a 24-hour basis. They had somebody praying for me every hour of every day, including this young man who just happened to be a former wow. yoga student himself, so he understood the language. And uh, those happen to be moments are usually set up by God. Yeah. I, I say coincidences are when uh, God works a miracle and remains anonymous. Yeah. It's not really a coincidence, it's a God incidence. But uh, anyway, he was walking in a laundromat and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, don't go in there, get back in your car, I've got a job for you to do. He didn't tell him that the yoga teacher he'd been praying for for a month was two miles down the road hitchhiking. He didn't explain all of those details. See, most people want God to give them all the information <laughs> and then they'll act on it. You've got to act on the information you've received. And then as you take that step, God will give you the next step mm -hmm. and then the next step. So he got in his van and started driving. And whenever he felt that impulse, he would turn and God led him to the very spot where I was standing there hitchhiking. And that just happened to be, another coincidence, <laughs> the day that I had dedicated to Jesus because I'd gotten a letter from an old friend of mine telling me Jesus was the only way, which I thought was completely illogical. I thought all religions were different paths to God. But that day I got up early in the morning and said, you know what, Jesus, I'm maybe I've misinterpreted you. So I'm going to dedicate this whole day to you and I'm not going to do any chanting of Hindu mantras. I'm not going to read any Hindu scripture. All I'm going to do is read the Bible and pray to you. And if you're the only way, and if you're the savior of the world, I believe you'll give me a supernatural sign today. So all these wow. parts are fitting together. And so I prayed all day long, nothing happened. But while I was standing on the road hitchhiking to teach at USF, I was still praying. This is your day, Jesus. <laughs> and this van pulls over. And I open the door to the van and look in, and there's a picture of Jesus taped to the ceiling of the van. I knew wow. this is it. This <laughs> is what I've been praying about all day long. And a few moments later, he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, have you ever experienced Jesus coming into your heart? I said, no, but when can I? And he gave me this wild look like you're not supposed to give in that quick. 
<laughs> and uh, he said, come to our prayer meeting tonight. I said, I don't want to wait. I've been praying about it all day long. He said, okay. And we pulled over to the side of the road. And, and this is powerful. Well, can I ask, did he know who you were? Did he recognize you? Not at first. Oh, when he okay. picked me up hitchhiking, he thought it was just oh, another okay. guy yeah. hitching for a ride. But once I introduced myself, he knew, I've been praying for you for a month. And so wow. it was an instant connect. But he introduced me to about a half a dozen promises. My book, as you've mentioned, is called 25 Powerful Promises from God. And in one of the beginning chapters, I talk about how promises birth us into the kingdom. Like Ephesians 3.17 says, Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. Romans 10.13, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.9 and 10, if we confess in our, with our lips and believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. And uh, who, uh, whosoever uh, thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And uh, I will give, uh, God said, I will give him living water and he'll never thirst again. So all of these promises were introduced to me and I acted on those promises. And it was like each one of those promises was a heavenly spotlight, like these big lights around the set here that suddenly was flipped on and that light started shining down in my life. And then another promise and then another promise and then another promise until I was heaven's focus. And I just said, Jesus, if you're there, if you died on the cross for me, come into my heart. And bam, what happened was explosive. I may not have felt an internal explosion spiritually, but the Bible says, and here's a promise, uh, giving thanks unto the Father who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of God's dear son, which means to be removed from one spiritual state to another in a moment of time. All of a sudden, I changed identities. I was no longer a child of darkness. I became a child of light. I was no longer uh, under the dominion of Satan. I was under the authority of God and everything changed. So now right. he's ordering your steps because I wanted you to share because he says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. So now you are righteous in his sight because you've been washed in the blood of his son, Jesus. So you're in Bombay, India and I'd like you to tell that story because well, he orders our steps. Well, let me back up and say okay. he must have even ordered my steps. Not that he authored it, but he allowed it. He allowed me to pass through a period of time in my life where I studied Eastern religions deeply because it empowered me. That's a promise. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God. It empowered me to have an authoritative way of speaking with Hindu people because uh, I've been there, I've embraced that worldview and I no longer do. I embrace a biblical worldview now, but I understand the battles of the mind that Hindus go through. So anyway, you asked me about that particular incident. I'm, I, I write about it in the book. I was coming back after a month of ministry in India. <clears throat> Fantastic time. We some of the meetings, there were over a thousand people a night getting saved. It was just fantastic. Oh, and we were flying back to the U.S. and I, or I was flying. I happened to be alone that time. And uh, I had a 12 hour layover in Bombay, which I wasn't really happy about because I didn't want to sit in a, <laughs> in, a, in a very warm and crowded airport for 12 hours. But then I got this message from the airline company that if we had over an eight hour uh, layover, they would put us up in a five star hotel. And I thought, this is God, whoa, <laughs> I've never been around luxury like that. And so they uh, ushered us over there in a, a shuttle and uh, I walked in and the first thing I saw was a restaurant right there next to the check-in desk. And the advertisement that night was steak and lobster. And I'd been eating rice and beans for a month. So I thought, <laughs> yes, double blessing. A luxurious air conditioned room and a fancy meal. And so I had, after checking in, I headed for the restaurant. And I got halfway through the door of the restaurant and God speaks to me. And I don't want it to be God. <laughs> he said, don't go in there. Go out on the street. I've got something for you to do. You know what I said? I said, is that you, God? <laughs> like we all do. I knew it was him. I was just hoping that he would say, no, I'm just kidding, go on in. <laughs> but uh, kind of begrudgingly, I went out on the street and I knew that if I was going to succeed at whatever God sent me out there to do, I had to be 
forceful in the spirit. So I walked down the street just saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not as a prayer, but as a proclamation. Because when you say your kingdom come, your will be done, you're saying, God, I decree your kingdom will manifest in this atmosphere and God is in charge on this street. And I walked down this alley next to the hotel praying that. And all of a sudden, this short little Hindu, uh, former Hindu man, he was a Christian now, the short little man ran out of the restaurant next to the hotel, a different restaurant. And he ran up to me and with this wide-eyed look on his face, he said, what is your name? In a high-pitched voice, I said, my name is Mike Shreve. He said, Mike Shreve, that sounds like a Christian name. By any chance, are you a Christian? I said, I am a Christian. He said, by any chance, are you a Pentecostal preacher? I said, I am a Pentecostal <laughs> preacher. He said, good, there's a man needs to get saved right now. Come quickly, come quickly. <laughs> I looked at him dumbfounded at first. I thought nobody's ever run out of Shoney's <laughs> or, or, or some steakhouse here in the U.S. saying somebody needs to get saved. So I, I was almost uh, uh, stunned to the point of not responding. I thought this is just two way out. Well, this guy had been witnessing to his boss for three years. And his boss coincidentally just came into work that night and walked up to him and said, you know what, on my way to work, I decided what you've got is real, and I want it. And he's intimidated, praying for his own boss. So he just takes off running and goes outside the restaurant, hoping there'll be somebody out there to help him pray. And I just happened to be walking by halfway around the world from home. My ordered steps leading me to the right place at the right time. Well, I, I, went, I got to tell you the rest of the story. I witnessed to that restaurant owner back in the alley behind his restaurant. We talked for about uh, 45 minutes or an hour. He gave his heart to the Lord. And then he said, as we walked back to the restaurant, he said, when we get back, I'm going to turn the lights down low. I'm going to close all the shutters and I'm going to lock the door. And I said, what happens after that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know exactly what he had in mind. He said, then I'm going to call all my cooks and waiters out. And I want you to tell them what you just told me. I said, well, what uh, religions are represented in your kitchen? He said, I have a Buddhist, I have a Jainist, I have three Hindus, I have a Catholic. He named about six or seven world religions and he brought them all out. Some of them didn't speak English, so he interpreted my message five minutes after being saved. I preached for about 45 minutes to an hour and every cook and every waiter in that restaurant gave their hearts to the Lord. And by the end of our session, about 75% had been filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And a bunch of them were laying on the floor wow. out under the power of God. It was phenomenal. Boy, that's our God. I, never, I never missed the steak and lobster. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad God moved that way. But I, I would have missed a, such a phenomenal experience if you don't walk through if that I door. If I hadn't listened to God. <laughs> if, if I hadn't listened to God. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've, got to, you've got to have a hearing ear. You've got to have your antennas up. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Isaiah 50, verse 4, God said, uh, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is where he wakens my ear morning by scripture. morning. That's love a promise. that scripture, yeah. That's a promise. He awakens we'll our ear too. to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take a break, and the Groover family is going to come back and sing for us. What a beautiful name. And what a beautiful name that is, the yes, name of Jesus. And that's what we do. Terry Tripp's Empower Minute. I'm standing in Nashville, Tennessee. I live not too far from here, and Nashville is one of the most creative cities I've ever been in. From music to arts to production, it buzzes with creativity. Sadly, creativity is not honored and celebrated in our culture like it should be. Yet, there's a good reason why we should encourage creativity. The opening page of the Bible tells us how God created the universe, and we have been created in his likeness and image. We have the same power that raised Christ from the dead in us. That power is a creative force. You possess it. Use it for the glory of God. 
That's why I support Christian television. Every day they are creating an atmosphere of faith and hope. Support this station financially.
Oh, we love, love that song. Love it, love it. Thank you so much. Ah, his name is Jesus. <laughs> and that's who we've been talking about. We've been talking about the promises of God, the miracles that God performs for those that love him. And today, if you love him, he'll perform miracles for you, too. He will. He will. And we've been talking to Mike Shreve, and he's been <laughs> telling us some <laughs> incredible stories. And uh, what's the story? He's got another one. Uh, oh. But this is the promise of our spiritual weapons and how you use these spiritual weapons when you went to see, were you going to preach in this pastor's church and you right. went to his house and he said, come on, go with me. Yeah, and it, you said, it was Where we Upper go? State, New York. And right when I pulled up to the pastor's home after driving all day, yeah. I knocked on the door and he came to the door and said, oh, I'm glad you're here. Let's go. I didn't feel like going anywhere. I said, where are we going? He said, the insane asylum. And he never elaborated. And I said, do you treat all your visiting evangelists this way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, then he explained to me that one of his best members, a very godly woman who led his intercession team, uh, had, had a mental breakdown and she was in the asylum. And uh, really in a spiritual kind of a state of stupor where she, she would not acknowledge anyone coming in the room. If you tried to talk to her, she'd just stare off into space. She never bathed herself, never clothed herself, never fed herself. She was just uh, kind of a, in a semi-catatonic state, I guess you would call it. But uh, she would just sit there all day long in the cell just oblivious to everything and anyone. And uh, he said, come and let's pray for her. She was married to an abusive man that constantly berated her and downgraded her and told her how stupid and ugly and worthless she was. And it, if you got down close to her, you could hear her muttering those self-degrading kind of statements. And so mm -hmm. she, she finally believed the lies. And isn't that what happens yeah, with demonic right. attacks on people's lives too? They're constantly being fed these lies. You'll never make it. You're going to backslide. You're still an alcoholic. You'll go back to that drink. And, and, and when you finally believe the lies and succumb to it, your life implodes. And that's what happened to her. She finally believed this horrible, horrible thing that the husband, not much of a husband. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I say man doesn't have a right to call himself a man if he's a predator in the home. We're called to be the protectors and the providers of our home, not Amen. predators. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, long story short, they took us in the room there where she was and gave us five minutes with her. And the pastor invited me to uh, minister to her. She never acknowledged me even being next to her, but I got in close to her and I thought, I'm going to do this the same way Jesus did. When he faced off with the devil himself, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. So I thought, even though she doesn't act like she hears me, I believe her heart hears me. And so I'm going to pump every promise I can into her spirit. And I'm going to proceed it with the statement, it is written, to uh, validate the power and the authority of that promise. So I began speaking. I said, it is written. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is written. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. It is written. All things work together for good to those who love God. It is written. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is written. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. It is written. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Over and over again. Then I, I looked at my watch and I said, oh, pastor, I said, we've only got 30 seconds left. We better pray for her. They gave us five minutes. So he and I both laid hands on her and began praying in tongues at the but top. But you said, let's go for it. Yeah, yeah. I said, let's go for it. Let's <laughs> command her to be free. And we prayed over and the Holy Spirit just burst forth from both of us in tongues at the same time. Well, they apparently had somebody listening outside the door and they thought that was too off the wall. And so they threw the door open. These two bouncers came and grabbed us and led us to the front door and threw us out and said, you can't do that in here. <laughs> but we had already done enough damage to the devil's kingdom because when they ushered us out so rudely, that woman got up, bathed herself, clothed herself, went up to the front desk and said, call my family. I don't need to be in here anymore. God's Praise giving me my God. mind. Praise and God. so I used That's the weapons. See, uh, you mentioned weapons yes. of warfare. 
Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So the strongholds are, uh, are areas of negative thinking in our minds where we submit to the authority of a lie. Uh, and Joyce Myers calls it stinking thinking. Yes. And, and, and so we take the weapons like the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, which you mentioned, Bob, the word of God, which is a sword in our hands. Yes. And we use those weapons to tear down these strongholds in our minds of fear, depression, self-condemnation, guilt, anxiety about the future. We bring those down by quoting the promises of God. It is written, it is written. And if it can restore a woman's sanity, it can restore a person to health in your body. Quote Exodus 15, 26, where God said, I am the Lord who heals you. And hold to that and expect a miracle to come to pass. Amen. Amen. Wow, that must have been some church service. Oh, and she you... came back to the church that week in my revival. She attended. Really? She did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one thing. It was explosive. I... I can't remember if you said this or not, but they told you in the beginning, nothing religious when they let you in, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I didn't agree. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> you just smiled. Because I knew if I said, okay, I agree with you, I won't do anything religious, then I'd be lying. Yeah. And I couldn't lie and then expect God That's to right. move a few minutes later. So when they said nothing religious, I just smiled. And I thought, <laughs> well, let them interpret that smile any way they want. <laughs> Because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I'm here on God's business, and I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Yeah. Amen. Oh, wow. I want you to look at that camera there. Okay. And tell people the incredible works of God yeah. that they may or may not even believe. And I, I know there's people watching all over the country, and they need to know Christ. And you're the guy to do it. Well, I'm going to pray for five things. I'm going to pray for five things. First and foremost, salvation. But then healing for your body, deliverance from demonic attacks on your mind, like the woman we just mentioned, children coming into the kingdom of God, and prosperity in your family, in your business, in your own personal life. So all of those things are important. Most important is salvation. And if you've never accepted Jesus in your heart, then I want you to act on the promises I acted on that changed my life forever. And just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, surrender to you. I surrender to you. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your precious blood. And be Lord of my life from this day forward. By faith, I receive the gift of eternal life. Now, I believe, and you need to say, I believe, Lord, and I accept my salvation. Now, I'm also praying that you'll be healed, that you'll see revival in your family, that you'll be prospered. Father, I just pray and I claim for every person that's watching this program that you will be healed, delivered, set free. Just lay your hand on your chest and say, I receive my miracle today. I receive a miracle in my children, a miracle in my finances, a miracle in my health. I receive a miracle in my mental strength. I receive miracles in Jesus' name because God's promised them. And watch them come to pass. Praise God. Hey, Praise Thank man. you. Oh, we can't thank you enough, Mike. Yes, thank you for all these Coming and truths. sharing these wonderful truths with, uh, with us. Yes. And you, you've been born again. If you prayed that prayer and invited Christ That's into right. your life. You're a born again Christian. So welcome Part to the family. Part of the family of God. <laughs> God bless, bless you. you.